Hello, and welcome to this lecture entitled Black Resistance to Jim Crow in Alabama, 1890 to 1930. Now, please be aware that these dates are only approximations. I'll talk about institutions that began before 1890 and others that lasted until well after 1930. But Jim Crow proper took place during this four decade era and resistance to it occurred in a way that was different than the militancy of the post-World War II civil rights era. We'll examine these three topics, direct protests against Jim Crow, the much more important building of parallel institutions, and the rise and decline of the NAACP. Let's look at two instances of direct protest to creation of Jim Crow laws. They were, there were more in and outside of Alabama, but these are both emblematic and really the last gasp of blacks organizing uh, to go toe to toe against such laws. The first is the Montgomery streetcar boycott of 1900 to 1902. Streetcars were an important battlefield for Jim Crow. It was probably the only place that blacks met whites as equals. Everyone paid the fare and only custom determined seating. It was a space that was ripe for applying Jim Crow law. <clears throat> Alabama had no state statute se segregating streetcars at that time. So Montgomery passed a city ordinance in 1900 that specified seats where blacks could sit. This led to an immediate boycott arranged by local ministers who were not fire-breathing radicals, but rather were Booker T. Washington type accommodationists. But they raised a protest against significant discrimination. Enforcement of the segregation ordinance fell to conductors and motormen and the company instructed those conductors and motormen to simply not enforce the ordinance in 1902. The boycott ended, but soon after, enforcement began anew and continued into the 1950s. The second and more detailed is the Mobile Streetcar Boycott of 1902. Mobile had no segregation ordinance for anything between 1865 and 1902. Common practices of segregation marked with things like lines and latticework screens separated races on mobile streetcars. As Jim Crow became firmer after Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896, mobile whites called for segregation ordinances in the summer and fall of 1900. Now, the whites were split. Some retained their Old South paternalism toward blacks, while others feared a boycott, like what was going on in Montgomery. Blacks were split too, with some supporting the old informal ways, but others asking for a more easily understood, more formal code that designated particular seats for each race. Black leaders' tone was accommodationist because some whites had proposed running separate cars for blacks and whites, which those leaders did not want. The Black Ministerial Alliance argued that black toughs were the ones causing white discomfort on the trams, but the city council passed its ordinance on October 12, 1902 to go into effect on November 1st. That day, November 1st, Blacks simply stopped riding the streetcars in a boycott organized by the Mobile Ministerial Alliance. The Mobile Light and Railroad Company began to feel the financial pinch of the boycott by early December. As in Montgomery, enforcement of the segregation ordinance fell to conductors and motormen, and the company instructed those conductors and motormen to simply not enforce the ordinance. Now in Mobile, police arrested three conductors on charges of failure to enforce, which was a misdemeanor. But on December 11th, 1902, the municipal court dropped charges on two of those. It, it found one guilty and fined him. So the company appealed. 
The boycott withered away early in January of 1903, and the company just simply let the appeal go moot. Unfortunately, the conductor had to pay his fine. Historian David Alsabrook wrote that the boycott was not a failure because the point wasn't to beat back the ordinance. That was impossible. But to bring the black community together to protest. He also notes that Mobile built its entire regime of segregation around this single law. It passed no other segregation ordinances, though it did update the streetcar ordinance in 1917 and allowed white public opprobrium and citing of this streetcar ordinance to segregate, quote, parks, schools, churches, restaurants, housing, hotels, theaters, hospitals, saloons, brothels, and cemeteries, unquote. More important than direct protests was building parallel institutions. Boxed in by laws that restricted access to white institutions, as well as practices that limited equal opportunity and limited access to capital, Alabama blacks created a more or less robust segregated society. We'll discuss churches, businesses, and newspapers, although I do have to say there are many more things to discuss as well. One of the first parallel institutions founded by African Americans after emancipation were separate black churches. Most blacks in Alabama lived in the black belt, and most of those folks were Methodists or Baptists. Three great denominations emerged from the African American experience with Methodism, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, uh, Zion Church, and the Colored Methodist Episcopal Church, which in 1954 renamed itself the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. The AME, African Methodist Episcopal, was founded in Philadelphia in 1816, and it founded its first mission in Alabama in Selma in 1867. By 1872, it had 66 churches and almost 10,600 members. AME Zion was officially founded in 1821 in New York City, though it had operated earlier than that. Its Alabama conference first met in Mobile in 1867, which meant that it had been operating already, and reported 6,700 members. By the time it split into two conferences in 1880, its membership had crested 30,000. The Colored Methodist Episcopal Church was founded in 1870, that is after emancipation, in Jackson, Tennessee. It was always a small denomination, but spread in Alabama and throughout the South steadily. It founded six colleges in five states, including Miles College in Alabama in 1905. A 2006 estimate puts membership worldwide at 850,000, and a 2021 estimate uh, puts it at 1.5 million because of aggressive missionizing in the Caribbean and in Africa. Now, the largest denomination of African Americans in Alabama was, as you might expect, Baptists. Wilson Fallon's book, Uplifting the Race, is a fine source for both information on Baptists and for general history of the century between emancipation and the civil rights movement. Fallon maintains that after the Civil War, black Baptists slowly but surely separated from their white churches, a process that was complete by the time the Redeemers took over Alabama government in 1874. Black Baptists formed their own convention in 1868 when they had 50 churches. By 1900, they had 1,846 churches formed in 76 local associations, and they had 186,000 members. All denominations created publishing arms and newspapers to spread their work. CME and Baptist created colleges, 
so did AME and AMEZ, but in Alabama, CME and Baptist were, were more likely to uh, create a college. And Baptist women founded their own Women's Baptist State Convention of Alabama in 1886 to support education, particularly to support Selma College, and to support mission work. All denominations participated in politics as representatives of the African-American community particularly in the short, unsuccessful fight over disfranchisement in the Alabama Constitution of 1901. Once the Constitution passed and African Americans were systematically disfranchised, all of the denominations then turned inward, building their communities parallel to white society in the space that was left for them. Now, it wasn't just the churches that did this. Blacks also expanded benevolent and secret societies such as the Masonic Orders, particularly the Prince Hall Masons, the Odd Fellows, and the Knights of Pythias. And there were dozens of others of these uh, organizations as well, although much smaller than these three. Women, too, participated in church mission societies, literary societies, uplift societies, and Masonic Orders. Carrie Tuggle, who we'll talk about a little bit more in a minute, edited the newspaper of the Grand Lodge Knights and Ladies of Honor, for example. In rural Alabama, blacks were all but locked out of being merchants, and there was little call for personal services that blacks perform commercially in cities like Birmingham. But in Birmingham, there were enough black businesses to warrant examination. Historian Franklin Wilson found in examining the Black Business District of Birmingham that whites controlled the retail trade where mere transactions prevailed, while law and custom allowed blacks to operate personal service businesses like barbering, restaurants, and medical services. Wilson wrote in 1975 that the business district of Birmingham was integrated until about 1900 and that blacks then concentrated their shops in an area bounded by 14th and 19th streets and bounded by 2nd and 6th avenues, which was just west of the old central business district. Wilson theorizes that more whites created businesses in the central business district and increasing rents drove blacks to the less desirable areas beyond 14th Street. But also that the city used its business licensing power to restrict both type and location of black businesses. Birmingham's black business district became a world of its own after that sensationalized in novels and stories in the newspaper as both somewhat posh yet quite seedy with legitimate businesses and underground trade happening simultaneously. During the early years of Jim Crow, a number of black businesses grew large under people considered race leaders according to Lynn Feldman's master's thesis about the Birmingham community of Smithfield and also about downtown businesses. She tells the story of William R. Pettiford, pastor of the 16th Street Baptist Church in the 1880s, who founded the Alabama Penny Savings Bank in 1890. He envisioned an institution to cultivate the virtue of thrift among black workers who he perceived as wasting their small wages on liquor and gambling while providing financing to blacks that they could not get from white institutions. Pettiford kept the penny savings bank going until he died in 1914, but soon after he died, it failed. Other African-Americans founded similar banks in Birmingham, like the People's Investment and Banking Company and the Prudential Savings Bank. Another thriving industry, at least in Birmingham, was benevolence, what we call insurance, that provided health, accident, and life insurance to the black community. Ministers were active in, finding, um, the, in founding these groups as well. Sometimes they founded them as associations, other times as for-profit businesses. One example is that of Reverend Thomas Walker, who organized the Afro-American Benevolent Association in the 1890s, then incorporated it with the legislature in 
1901 as the Union Central Relief Association. When these benevolent societies operated as associations rather than for-profit businesses, there was little distinction between them and social clubs. In fact, they often began as social clubs and as secret orders, then started to provide death benefits and occasional aid to struggling members. This directly parallels white experience and with a sense of community that these associations built is why so many Americans, both black and white, joined such groups throughout the Gilded Age through the Progressive Era and the 1920s uh, into the Great Depression. Now, of course, the medical profession had a black parallel to white practice that included physicians, nurses, dentists, and even hospitals. As it so happens in Birmingham, there were three private hospitals for blacks run by black physicians. This was common in both the white and black community, though black doctors had less access to capital, and so their hospitals were not as large, the care was a little uh, more difficult, and so forth. Let's talk about newspapers. Historian Alan Jones tracks the slow rise of black newspapers beginning immediately after the Civil War. Frequently, these were edited by white men, even when the papers themselves were owned by blacks. From 1865 to 1880, Alabama had 12 black newspapers. Many were organs of the Republican Party or, like James Rapier's Montgomery uh, Republican Sentinel, were campaign newspapers that really only had a life of one uh, campaign. In the 1880s, the number of papers founded in the decade jumped to 75. Most were short-lived, but they were in both the Black Belt and in cities with large black populations. Why this is is because a rising economy in the 1880s and rising black literacy created a market. Black activists used newspapers to protest conditions, called for increase, increased racial consciousness in the face of the rising clouds of discrimination that were on the horizon. Selma was a hotbed of this with nine newspapers over the decade of the 1880s. But it was editors from the larger cities, Mobile, Montgomery, Birmingham, who found themselves run out of town for speaking harshly of inequality. There were also many clergymen among the editors, such as William Pettiford of Birmingham, who I just told you was both a pastor and the founder of the Alabama Penny Savings Bank. Now, the Alabama Colored Press Association formed in 1887, but lasted only until 1889, when all of its officers were chased from their respective cities by white mobs. 100 new newspapers arose in the decade of the 1890s, finding new readers among black immigrants from the Black Belt into Birmingham, Montgomery, and Mobile for the most part. Editors were less militant in general because of the rising accommodationist influence of Booker T. Washington, who you'll remember delivered his Atlanta Compromise speech in 1895. Jim Crow tightened its grip after 1900, and black newspapers acted within the bounds of what was possible. Seventy new newspapers were founded between 1900 and 1910, and 135 were founded between 1900 and 1920. The first two years of the century, 1900-1901, saw editors argue both for and against the Alabama Constitution of 1901 that enshrined Jim Crow. That slacked off after an initial burst because segregation set firm parameters around black agency and was enforced by legal, extra-legal, and informal means. But legal segregation led to the rise in interest in black news as African Americans created a parallel society. And after 1915, there was an absolute drop in the number of black newspapers. They flourished only in cities like Birmingham, Montgomery, Mobile, but also they had spread out and flourished in Huntsville, Anniston, Sheffield, and Dothan. 
Two black news editors of note, and by far they're not the only ones, were Oscar Adams of the Birmingham Reporter, which he founded in 1906 and which lasted till 1934, who was a member of the AME Zion Church and whose son became the first black justice of Alabama's Supreme Court. Another was Kerry Tuggle, editor of the official organ of the Grand Lodge Knights and Ladies of Honor, which was a newspaper called Truth. Tuggle also founded the Tuggle Institute, a privately run charity and school in Birmingham that lasted from 1903 until Tuggle's death in the 1920s and the Great Depression forced it to close in 1933. The last mechanism of black resistance to Jim Crow that we'll examine is the Alabama NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. The authority on the NAACP in Alabama is Dorothy Autry, whose doctoral dissertation is entitled, The National Association for the Advancement of Colored People in Alabama, 1913 to 1952. Uh, this was published in 1985 as her doctoral dissertation for her degree from Notre Dame. The national NAACP was founded by an interracial group in 1909 from a combination of other organizations that included W.E.B. Du Bois's Niagara Movement, Alabama's first branch, and it required a minimum of 50 members, opened in, of all places, Talladega in 1913, not Birmingham, Montgomery, or Mobile, where the large black population existed, but in Talladega. But I think this is telling for the history of civil rights organizations. Autry speculates that it was the presence of Talladega College that led to this particular branch forming. Talladega College was an HBCU that did not subscribe to the industrial school ideal that permeated black education in Alabama. Rather, it retained its grounding in a classical liberal arts curriculum. And that, I think, is the issue. The NAACP had a difficult time in Alabama, and I think largely because it drew its membership from the professional and skilled labor class, that is, the black upper middle class. And its program until World War II was to watch local conditions, report egregious discrimination incidents to the national, and to work with local authorities kind of quietly to ameliorate local problems. It was not at all militant, and after World War II, its national tactic was to sue in federal court. Now, that's fine, but it's not going to generate a whole bunch of people who are going to go marching in the street. In fact, the NAACP, certainly during the Civil Rights Movement, was on the other side of that. They didn't particularly care for marching in the street. They would rather sue in federal court, and it was the NAACP that won Brown v. Board of Education. Thurgood Marshall was their lawyer. Another problem in Alabama was the NAACP was an all-black organization. Other state organizations, other state branches, and the national were mixed race. So those mixed race branches were less isolated in the community. The NAACP was also part of the quote-unquote new Negro movement of black self-regard that and that they contrasted themselves with what they called the old Negro, marked by obsequiousness in the presence of whites. What you might say about new uh, Negroes, quote unquote, is that they took up space. Claude McKay coined that label in 1925 for the artists and writers of the Harlem Renaissance, but it applies more broadly and stretches backwards in time. It is not possible to know when the Talladega branch declined and went away, but probably between 1915 and 1917. Most Alabama branches lasted about two years, though it frequently took longer after they just declined into nothing for the national to withdraw charters. Between the last months of World War I in 1918 and the end of 1920, 
Alabama generated nine branches of the NAACP, but between 1920 and 1929 only added four, and many branches lost their charters during that decade. Autry notes that charters began with a militant zeal, especially right after World War I, but soon fell prey to the usual organizational problems of lethargy and ineffective leadership. But the NAACP in Alabama had racial problems. The relentlessness of Jim Crow led to hopelessness, despair, and resignation. And the rapid rise of the Ku Klux Klan and vigilante violence led to fear. The history of the NAACP in Alabama continued with increasing activity in the three large branches, Mobile, Montgomery, and Birmingham, but with little growth during the decade of the 1930s. There was phenomenal growth in the 1940s that was cut short by the rise of the Dixiecrats in 1948. Then there was a slight recovery after 1948 into the 1950s until, and get this, Alabama outlawed the NAACP in 1956. Branches still operated, but as local organizations with different names, and they could not be officially affiliated with the national NAACP. So let me summarize. Lynn Feldman wrote that the Plessy decision meant that blacks, quote, were forced to live a separate existence whereby they created their own communities where they did not suffer the inequities and humiliations of the dominant white society, unquote. Blacks in increasingly Jim Crow Alabama did indeed create parallel institutions like churches, businesses, newspapers, and even neighborhoods that we did not discuss in this lecture. Where all of these places were places where, though restricted by informal practices and lack of access to capital, African Americans could exercise agency over their lives. But they also protested their newly hardening place in Jim Crow society. In the Montgomery and the Mobile uh, streetcar boycotts of about 1900, about 1902, 1903, African Americans withdrew their patronage to register their displeasure, and though they did not win long-term change, they did stand against discrimination in a way that did not bring down the increasing wrath of the white community. This might sound cowardly, but given the violence of riots by whites against black communities and the prevalence of lynching, preserving the community while registering a protest was quite an accomplishment. Middle class blacks organized NAACP chapters from 1913 into the 1920s. Though most of these chapters failed within two years, at least three continued to operate and more chapters joined after World War II until in the wake of the Brown decision in 1954, the state of Alabama outlawed the organization. This then ends the lecture. As always, thanks for your attention.